Good morning, all. Welcome to today's class. I'm your facilitator for me, Johanna. As you can see on the slides today, we'll be taking business law. And what we'll be discussing is registration of business and compliance requirement. Registration of business and compliance requirement. What, uh, what are the objectives? The ob what we mean here is what do we want uh, participants to know by the time we are done with this lectures, there are certain things uh, I expect you to know. And I don't expect you to know everything, but to have a basic understanding of this uh, uh, registration of business and compliance requirements that we will be discussing. So first of all, participants are uh, to enable participants to have a basic understanding of the nature of the legal system in Nigeria is one of the objectives. To enable participants to understand the legal regime and regulatory agencies regulating businesses, for participants to know the types of business organization and steps in the formation and registration of business in Nigeria, understand the basic nature and elements in the commercial contracts. So these are the objectives that participants should have a basic understanding of by the time we are done with today's uh, lecture. So uh, we'll be discussing the Nigerian legal system. Okay, sorry, let's look at what are the topics that we are going to look about, uh, talk about. What are those topics that will enable participants have the understanding of all the objectives? So one of the topics is the Nigerian legal system. That is one, the relevant government agencies regulating businesses in Nigeria and types of business organizations and legal implication of the various types of business organization. So by the time we discuss the Nigerian legal system and we're done with it, you should be able to have a basic understanding of well, when somebody meets you and say, what is, what is the Nigerian legal system all about? Should that, by the time we are done, you have a basic idea of what that uh, Nigerian legal system is about. Then, what are those regulate, uh, relevant government agencies regulating businesses in Nigeria? By the time we are done, you also have an understanding. Then, types of business organization and legal implication of the various types of business organizations. So, we look at the types of business organizations that you can run. And if you are running a business already, that will enable you to know under which category of uh, business organization your, your business falls under. Then we have the various, uh, then we'll talk about registration of business organization. How do you go about registering these business organizations that you are running if it's not registered? If it is registered, what are the benefits? If you have not registered, what are the, oh, we'll look at them. Then finally, we'll discuss the law of contract. Because you know, once you are running a business, every day every day you are engaged in contract buying and selling your normal buying and selling is contract it doesn't have to be a huge sum of money for you to say uh, uh I'm, I'm i'm into a i'm i'm into a contract with somebody the normal buying and selling was there so when we look at law of contract you get to see some some transaction you engage in and you just regard it as everyday transaction but it's also contract so now we are going to look at the Nigerian legal system. When we say Nigerian legal system, we are talking about the totality of laws, rules, and uh, all the legal mechanisms that are obtained within Nigeria as a sovereign country. That means the constitution, we are, we are talking about the constitution, we are talking about other laws that emanated from the constitution like the ICPC Act, EFC, the Advanced Fee Fraud Act, uh, uh, the Dub Check Act. So all these acts we have and the rest, all these laws, penal code, criminal code, all of them, they are all part of the any law forming any government agency, forming any university. Then we talk about the courts, the courts, we talk about the enforcement agencies, the police, the customs, the those EFCC, ICPC, NDLEA, all these things are part, 
they form the Nigerian legal system because they are custodians of that laws and they implement such laws. So because of that, the totality of all this um, makes up the Nigerian legal system. So, so having looked at what uh, the Nigerian legal system is, which consists of the totality of the laws and legal rules and legal machineries which are obtained within Nigeria, we look at the concept of law. I know already everybody has a basic idea of law. What's well, law of these countries? It's common to hear people say, use the first laws of these countries, laws of these countries, laws of these countries, or it's, you, it's common for you to have laws within your family, churches, organization, basically is there to regulate the conduct of people to ensure that there is a way people behave there's a way people act so the law is always there to guard people so the concept of law may be may mean different things to different people as i earlier said but to the lawyer and the law profession is more interested in the narrow and guarded meaning of law as a rule of human conduct tacitly or firmly accepted by a people as binding and backed up by some mechanism for the sustenance of its binding nature. So you see, it has to be formally accepted by people that is binding. So when you decide to impose something on people and the people are not accepting same, then you cannot consider that to be a law. So because it's not accepted by the people, because if you check the preamble of the Nigerian constitution, if you check the preamble of the Nigerian constitution, what you see is you see that the people of Nigeria have agreed to come together to be bound by the constitution. So it, it's we, the people of Nigeria, we have firmly accepted the constitution to be binding on earth, but the constitution cannot just act in the vacuum. There must be some persons, some institutions must be in place to ensure that it is implemented and such things are backed up by some mechanisms. That's why we have the courts, we have the legislature, we have the, the executive arm of government. So these, gov these arms of government are there to ensure that these laws are enforced and implemented and people do as the law says so let's like for instance now as we are seeing the looting and the rest you can see now government is is, is using a mechanism to ensure that people follow the law because people have uh, there is a law that said do not destroy government property do not do so these are laws so by the time this we know that yes what the government did is a uh, wrong holding palliative but the law says you cannot go about stealing or destroying properties or stealing government property. So in such a case, in such a case, the government will have to use its mechanism. And in this case is the police to implement such laws that talk about uh, that, that prohibits acts of arson, stealing government properties and the rest. So law, first of all, is there to conduct, to regulate human conduct, but it must be formally accepted and backed up by some mechanisms for its sustenance. So that is just love, the meaning, the narrow and guarded meaning of law for the purpose of this course and, and the law profession. So we we'll look at the sources of the Nigerian laws. When we talk of the sources of Nigerian laws, as you can see, we have common law and doctrine of equity. Common law and doctrine of equity are can be categorized under the English English received law. That means these are laws that we received from the English people while we were being colonized by them. That was those days that we are still a colony under the British. So the common law and doctrine of equity were uh, the form part of the English received law because we received some laws from the uh, from England. So they they are still part of our laws and common law when we talk about common law is nothing but is that part of law that was uh, that part of english law that was one it was developed it was formulated developed 
and administered by the old common law of the old uh, that was administered by the courts of the common law in England back in the days. So it was the developed, formulated, developed, and administered by the old common law, old common law courts in England back then. So that's just common law for you. But common law is basically on the, was from uh, the origin of common law is basically, it's from the custom and tradition of the English people. Because back then, the, there is no written law in England back then. So what happened was that uh, the king, the kings back then, they do send out what we call itinerant justices. And what this itinerant justice do is they administer just, uh, justice based on the custom and tradition of the people of that locality. So based on the tradition and custom of the people of that locality, they will administer justice. So as a result, after they've gone to various communities, because it's not just one justice, it's different justices. After they've gone to these communities and they've administered justices, then they will come and sit and say, okay, I went to this community, this law, this custom in this community is good, that custom in that community is good. So as a result, they evolved a common law for the English people, a common law that is administered by the common law courts. That's why I said it was uh, formulated, developed and administered by the old common law, uh, common law courts in England. But there, something happened with the common law. The common law is, is became more concerned about procedure and form. That is it's more concerned about procedure and form rather than administering justice. So if you are to obtain a writ, you can't even get that writ. Let me break it down. Let's say in under common law, let's say the law says, for instance, the law says, uh, if you are to draft any agreement, any agreement, whether it's selling of uh, one bottle of granite, it must be by, it must be in writing. Then parties decide to draft, uh, to have an agreement without putting it in writing. Even though there is such agreement and parties have agreed that, okay, uh, I'm going to sell a, a bottle of granite for you. But because common law says it must be in writing and you fail to put it in writing, common law will not be, the, because you fail to put it in writing and then you sold the granite to the other person and the other person failed to pay you back your money, what common law will do in this instance, common law will say, okay, since you fail to put that particular um, contract in writing, it's null and void. So if the person pays you, whether he pays you or not, it doesn't matter because you fail to put that uh, uh, contract in writing. So because of that, common law was more concerned about the form and procedure rather than administering justice. So because of that, litigants became, became, became uh, worried because they were not getting the justice they sought after. So as a, as a result of that, they began petitioning the Crown. So they petitioned the Crown to remedy the injustice that was done to them by common law. And when they petitioned the crown, that is the king or queen, depending on who was on the throne back then in England. Once they petitioned the crown, it is, it is the king's council that will listen to that petition. And as a result of petitioning the crown, so it, uh, they evolved the doctrine of equity, which will take me now to doctrine of equity. As I said, common law was more concerned about procedure and form than administering justice. So this doctrine of equity came in to mitigate, equity is not as the normal meaning of equity as fairness. Equity in this instance, and for the purpose of this class is, is equity, doctrine of equity as, as, sorry, the doctrine of equity in this context, we're talking about it's uh, equity to mitigate the harshness of common law. So litigants will normally petition the crown and once litigants petition the crown, it is the uh, king's council that will listen to such a uh, petition. And on, in the king's council, there, 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 there used to be a chancellor and that chancellor is a priest. So once they petition him, 
that influence of being a priest, he will use that to, to decide and administer justice. So doctrine of equity are laws that are developed by the court of chancery to mitigate the harshness of common law back then in England. Then that is it about the English receipt law, which comprises of the common law and doctrine of equity. And aside these two, there, are, there were other laws that we received from England. There are so many laws that we received from England, but basically for the purpose of this class, we'll look at the common law and doctrine of equity. Uh, then Nigerian legislation. When we talk of Nigerian legislation, we are basically talking of the laws that were enacted enacted by either the National Assembly or the House of Assembly of various states. It's common knowledge that uh, we know that uh, uh, before a law is passed in Nigeria, it has to be first deliberated on by the National Assembly or any House, uh, House of Assembly of any state that wishes to pass any law. For instance, let me use the recent uh, Companies and Allied Matters Act we know it, it went through the first reading, second reading, third reading before it was passed by the last National Assembly. So after it was passed by the National, national Assembly it, of uh, just 2020 of recent this year, Buari signed it into law. So these are, this, this is an example of a Nigerian legislation. So these are laws that are enacted by various house of, uh, by the National Assembly and the various house uh, of assembly of different states. So these laws, when enacted, become part of Nigerian law. And as a result, they, are, they also form sources of the Nigerian law. So the Nigerian legislation also is a source of Nigerian law. Then we go to customary law. When we talk of customary law, just like, so basically customary law is similar to common law and doctrine of equity of England, especially the common law, only that what people normally argue is that our customary law are not codified, but that doesn't mean they are not applicable and they are not sources of our laws. There are some customs that have become notorious. When we say they have become notorious, that because of constantly uh, uh, putting such custom into practice, they have become notorious that when issues of relating to such custom come before the courts, the court will not even need any witness to say, okay, uh, uh, we need a witness to come and show us that this custom is applicable in that particular locality. No, because that custom, because it has been applied repeatedly in that particular locality, it has become notorious that it's just, once it comes before the court, the court will just apply it. Because you know, example of such law is the Benin law on, on inheritance where the first son inherits the father's uh, uh, property, the, the house where the father is staying. And example of such case where the Supreme Court settled the matter and, and, and applied to that custom is the case of Idenhen versus Idenhen. So customary law are customs and traditions of the people. Sorry is a body of custom and traditions which regulate the various kinds of relationship between members of the community in their traditional settings. So these customary laws still form parts of our law. As I give the example of the Benin custom where if the father dies, the first son, the first son, not the first child, inherits the house he was uh, occupying at the time of his death. Then uh, we have the judicial precedent. What we say judicial precedent or case law, like the case of this Eden versus Eden that I used is an example of case law and precedent. Case law simply means a precedent. These are, you know, after the Nigerian legislation, uh, that is the National Assembly has made laws or the House of Assembly. If, if there is a problem, problem of interpretation arises as a result of that law enacted by the National Assembly or House of Assembly. You know, they usually go to court. So that interpretation given by court becomes a law too. That is why it's common for you to see lawyers citing the case, in the case of so, so, so the Supreme Court decided, in the case of so, so, and so, so the Court of Appeal decided. So when we talk of judicial precedent, precedent and case law, so as a result of 
the uh, judiciary interpreting such laws they are in the course of doing that formulating laws that's why you will see when we are when we talk of hierarchy of nigerian court subsequently you see that the highest court in nigeria the supreme court once it decides on a matter other courts will have to follow it as precedent so once the supreme court decides that this is the decision on a particular issue other courts it becomes the law of the land it becomes the law of the country then other courts subsequent courts lower to the supreme court will have to follow that decision that has been laid down by Supreme Court. So this is basically about the judicial precedent and also is a source of Nigerian law. Then we have the hierarchy of the Nigerian courts, sorry, the international law. Let's discuss the international law. So when we talk of international law, it's just there to, it also some international laws form part of our own law, especially our constitution. If you check section four of uh, enforcement of fundamental human rights. You know, we have the African Charter on Human Rights. It, uh, basically, we domesticated that into our constitution. We have the, the United Nations De Declaration on Human Rights. All these are international laws that have influenced how we formulated our laws. We used such laws as an example or as precedent for us to come up with us or our you know by section 12 sub 1 of the constitution it says for any international law to have a binding effect in nigeria it must be domesticated so we've domesticated some international laws and you know these international laws are there to 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 get a relationship between different countries and this international law could be uh, customary practices could be treaties it could be conventions like we have different conventions, we have different treaties that are on international level that Nigeria has domesticated and it has formed part of its law. So basically, Nigeria international law too is another source of uh, is another source of the Nigerian law. So we have very hierarchy of the Nigerian courts. When we talk of hierarchy of the Nigerian courts, we're talking of how courts are arranged in Nigeria. We're going to look at them from descending order from the highest to the lowest courts in nigeria so we have the supreme court as i said the supreme court is the apex court in the country that's the last court in the country where all once an issue is decided by the supreme court it becomes final that's it becomes a law it becomes final so there is no any other court you can go to because the supreme court of nigeria as far as the laws in nigeria as are concerned and where parties are, are parties in Nigeria, your issues and matter ends at the Supreme Court. Then we have the Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal is next to the Supreme Court, as the name implies, Court of Appeal. So it hears appeals from various courts, courts like the Federal High Court, State High Court, National Industrial Court, and different courts, and sorry, and different tribunals too, tax tribunal, uh, securities and exchange tribunal, all this, their appeal goes to the court of appeal. So the court of appeal is, is the second in hierarchy. Even though I said all matters in the Supreme Court, uh, and all matters, all issues are finally decided in the Supreme Court. There are exceptions like matters on uh, elections, like National Assembly and House of Assembly. The, the, the court of the decision of this court of appeal is final on those ones. You don't once the court of appeal have, have uh, the court of appeal has decided on on such matters, you cannot go to any other court except uh, that that's the final determination of the matter. You cannot proceed to the supreme court when it comes to election matters pertaining to national assembly and and house of assembly. The final court is Court of Appeal, as provided by the Electoral Act of 2010. Then we have the Federal High Court. The Federal High Court used to be a revenue court, but eventually it evolved. So by virtue of Section 251 of the Constitution, the Federal High Court is vested with the exclusive jurisdiction to entertain matters. That is, it has exclusive jurisdiction to entertain matters provided for in Section 251 of the Constitution. What are those matters provided in Section 251? Some of those matters are matters pertaining to karma, matters on federal government agencies that relates to policy and the rest. All these are matters that are exclusive to the Federal High Court. 
Then we have the state high courts. The state high courts have exclusive jurisdiction. They have exclusive jurisdiction on criminal and civil matters too. The state high courts, but the matters that are within the exclusive jurisdiction of the federal high court and the national industrial courts and matters that are Sharia courts and that are related to Sharia, those ones are not within the jurisdiction of the state high courts. There we have the national industrial courts. The national industrial courts are these are courts that are set up for the purpose of entertaining matters uh, regarding to trade unions and employment, master servant relationship and dress. These are these are exclusively for national industrial courts. So once there are matters relating to such uh, uh, employment, maybe dismissal. Uh, benefits and the rest, the court with the exclusive jurisdiction is the uh, National Industrial Court. Then we have the Sharia Courts. The Sharia Courts are there to entertain matters that relate to Islamic law. So once parties are governed by Islamic personal law, they can submit themselves, they can submit themselves to the jurisdiction of this court. Then we have the customary courts. As I said earlier, the customary, they administer the customs and traditions of those people in that particular locality. So normally the people presiding such courts must have the knowledge of, uh, of that particular custom. For, uh, yeah, of that particular custom. Area courts and customary courts, they are, they, are, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are similar things. It's just that in area, area courts in the North and FCT, then customary courts in the South. So that's what, then we have the magistrate court. The magistrate court has jurisdiction to entertain civil and criminal matters, but it has a limited jurisdiction in monetary terms and in terms of the subject matter it uh, decides on too. Then, so we've looked at the hierarchy of courts. So let's just look at civil law. Uh, civil law is basically, is there to conduct the, is regulate, uh, human conduct in their personal dealings with each other. That means it's there to regulate relationship between persons, private citizens. That's why we have uh, civil law. It confers obligation and status and rights on persons. So civil law is just there to regulate relationship between different private citizens. It's not like between the state and, and that person. Civil law is there. That's why we have, for, for instance, say defamation. And defamation can be libel or slander. That means uh, it can be libel or slander. That means libel where, it, where somebody says something about you that is not true and is published. Or then slander where it's just uttered with word of mouth. So for example, transfers where you are in exclusive possession of the property and somebody decides to transfer on, on the property. So also all these are examples of, uh, of civil uh, wrongs that the civil law would tend to regulate between private citizens. Then we have the Nigerian criminal justice system. This by virtue of, if you check section 36 of 11 of the constitution, it says for there to be a crime that particular, uh, for a person to be punished for an offense, that particular offense must be defined by the, uh, it, that particular offense must be defined and penalty must be given for such a person to be tried for such an offense. So basically the criminal law is, is, is written. So once you violate anything, let's say, uh, let's say the Advanced Fee Fraud Act and the rest, once you violate anything, there is provisions for penalty where you'll be punished for being. So definitely the criminal law is there to ensure the smooth running of states. That's why we have the criminal law system. So as on this slide, you can see the judiciary, the police, the FCC, all these there are there to ensure smooth running of the state. So when you commit a crime, like murder is not against, you are not just committing it against the private citizens, you are committing it against the state. That is why I call you, you see in cases of murder, you see state versus social so and social person. So basically, this is it on the Nigerian legal system, just for you to have a basic idea of the Nigerian legal system. Because these, especially these sources of Nigerian law, hierarchy of court, civil law, they are, they are topics on their own. But for the purpose of this class and the rest, just for you to have a basic idea, 
that's why we have to simplify everything in just this format then we're going to be looking at uh regulatory agencies the relevant regulatory agencies regulating businesses in nigeria so we have the corporate affairs commission which we will discuss in detail later then we have the federal inland revenue service that we we'll also discuss in detail subsequently then we have the central bank of nigeria so the central bank of nigeria as we all know we are all we were all we all know about the central bank of nigeria is the apex financial institution in nigeria central bank is there to 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 regulate financial institutions in nigeria and to ensure the overall growth of the nigerian economy and the the cbn was the central bank of nigeria was established by the cbn act of 1958 but the current framework regulating uh, legal framework regulating the activities of CBN is the CBN Act of 2007. And you know, the CBN is there to ensure that uh, policies give guidelines and policies to bank to ensure regulate financial institutions and the rest. So basically, that is the work of the CBN in, in brief. Then we have the Asset Management Corporation of Nigeria. The Asset Management Corporation of Nigeria it was established by the 2010 act, but it was subsequently amended by the 2019 act where some provisions in the act uh, was amended. The Asset Management Corporation of Nigeria is there to ensure the efficient management. Sorry, it's there to ensure liquidity flow in the Nigerian financial system. That is, there should be liquidity flow, that is cash flow in the Nigerian uh, financial uh, market, especially amongst banks. So, for instance, let me just give you uh, uh, an example of, uh, of 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 the kind of uh, uh, work Amcom does. For instance, a client, uh, let's say, a customer to a bank, borrows, let's say, money from the bank. Let's let me use Mr. John for instance. Mr. John borrows money from GT and Mr. John fails to pay that money over time. So that money will now become a non-performing loan. He has collected a loan from GT Bank and Mr. John is refusing to pay that loan. That loan eventually will become a bad debt to that bank because that person is not furnishing that loan. As a result, it becomes a non-performing loan. So what Amcom does is Amcom will come in and it will buy the loan from, it will pay off the loan on behalf of Mr. John to GT Bank. So by buying off that debt from GT Bank and paying off that debt, you see Amcom now is ensuring liquidity flow in the financial system. So what Amcom will do now, Mr. John is no longer indebted to GT Bank, rather he's indebted to Amcom. So Amcom will go after Mr. John for their money. So basically uh, the Amcom is there to ensure the management and severance of toxic as uh, toxic assets, especially non-performing loans in bank. Then we have the National Agency for Food and Drug Administration Control. We'll discuss that in detail subsequently. Then we have the Standard Organization of Nigeria, which we'll also discuss in detail subsequently. Then we have the Federal Capital Development Authority and state commissioners. So where your business is concerning it has to do with land you need to get land for something if you are within the fct you know you have to deal with the fca to get approval and the rest the over the various arms or agencies under the fca that deal with whatever uh, permit you need for you to carry out any building or any uh, structural adjustment you need to carry out on your building for a factory for the purpose of doing your businesses. We are going to look at the Corporate Affairs Commission now in details. The Corporate Affairs Commission was established by the Corporate, uh, by the Companies and Allied Matters Act of 1990. So the Corporate, uh, the uh, Corporate Affairs Commission is there, is just 
it is it is the regulatory agency in charge of the registration regulation of business and non-business organizations such as company business name and incorporated trustees so you can see if you want to register any business it's basically the work of uh, of CIS. so subsequently in the course of our discussion we'll look at the reg uh, registration procedures and documents to be submitted to CAC for registration and which is a crucial part of this class so i hope all of you will be around by the time we'll be discussing uh, this then by section 7 sub 1 of the camera 2020 as amended sets out the main function of CAC to include regulation supervision of the formation they they supervise the formation of company because before if you want to uh, form a company you, you know you have to there are documents pre cooperation documents that you need to submit to CAC so by doing that they are supervising the formation of that company the incorporation they incorporate the company for you after the incorporation they will still they will be involved in the management of such companies because you will need to be filing annual returns and and where your company is no longer a going concern, they, that means the business is no longer, you're no longer interested in running the business or you feel you're not making the profit, you need, you can voluntarily wind up the company or CAC itself will wind it up for you by order of court and the rest. So then they maintain a company's registry in all states of the Federation. For every filing you make, CAC is responsible for, to, to, to have such filings in their registry. Let's say you are doing change of directors, change of shareholders, or you are transferring shares to other persons. These are things that you must inform CAC that you are doing. It. So by doing that, CAC is maintained, has a registry of all companies in all, once you are registered with CAC, then you have a register your file is with CAC and as a result any change you are doing to your company you must inform the CAC where your board resolution and other documents you file at CAC then CAC also carry out has the part to carry out investigation into the affairs of the company if the situation demands so it's also the responsibility of CAC to carry out uh investigation to see whether you know in at, at the point of incorporation you submit the objects of your organization or company to CAC so if CAC finds out that the object of your company you are deviating from the object you submitted to them at the point of incorporation and you did not do any change of objects because you can subsequently amend your your objects and no amendment was made as to object then CAC has a right to investigate and if in the course of their investigation they find out that you're you've deviated from your objects they can uh, carry out the, in the course of that investigation order the court to wind up the company or take any necessary measures that is provided for by the is when it, that particular church is debating from its object and the rest it says you will not just come and say we are taking over it has to go to court because by virtue of section 36 of the constitution it says everybody is entitled to fair hearing so there must be fair hearing there will be investigation they will go to court court will give if uh, the court sees reasons why uh, says you should take over such company then it will take over such company based on the order of court. There is not that CAC will just go and take over a particular company. Then we have the Federal Inland Revenue Service. The FRS was established, used to be an arm of the federal board. Uh, uh, it used to be an arm of, uh, CAC used to be an arm of the FBI, uh, Federal Board of Inland Revenue. So subsequently, by virtue of the act establishing 
the FRS, that is the 2007 Act, it made it to be an autonomous, uh, an, an autonomous agency that is, is no longer under the Federal Board of Inland Revenue, rather is now an uh, autonomous agency. Well, the Federal Board of Inland Revenue still ex rules out policy and guidelines to, to the Federal Inland Revenue. We know that the Federal Inland Revenue is charged with the collection and administration of federal and corporate taxes. Aside the administration and uh, collection of federal corporate taxes, it also administer and control the different uh, different tax laws as specified in uh, the first schedule of the act establishing the FIRS. And it also enforce, it also administer and enforce the different tax amendments. It's the responsibility of uh, the federal inland revenue to control and administer the different tax amendments. These tax amendments can be the personal income tax, the company income tax, the value added tax, and the stamp duty act so these are examples of the various tax enactments that are administered and enforced by the federal inland revenue so all existing manufacturers distributors importers suppliers of goods and services are to register with their local VAT office so but for the purpose of this class we'll concentrate more on the value added tax and we know that the value added tax is a is, is, is a consumption tax that is levied repeatedly on a product or services being offered to people. So, and we are all aware that of recent, the federal government increased VAT from 5% to 7%, and we saw an increase in, 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 in products that, that are vatable, in products and services that are vatable. For instance, now if you make a call, you see the network telling you uh, VAT inclusive, telling you that they uh, 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 deducted their VAT. So at every point of buying, at every point of any service being offered to you, that particular person offering that service or selling that product for you will have to remove VAT, the value added tax. So once you are, you are into the buying of, you are into the business of selling products that are vatable to people and or services, you know that you need to remit your uh, value added tax to the Federal Inland Revenue Service, which is the designated agency by the federal government for the collection of such uh, taxes. So you need to re register with your local VAT office and remit such. However, it's not all, as I said, not all products and services are vatable. So uh, that's it on Federal Inland Revenue Services. Then we'll talk about uh, the Standard Organization of Nigeria. So the Standard Organization, uh, Standard Organization of Nigeria is a sole statutory body that is vested with the responsibility of standardizing and regulating the quality of all products in Nigeria all products in Nigeria, products that are not administered, that are not products administered by other agencies. For instance, where, pro where the product is a product that fall under the category of products that is within the uh, purview of NAFDA to administer such products, then standard of uh, organization of Nigeria cannot be said to be responsible for regulating the quality of such product that falls within the ambit of NAFDA. So standard organization of Nigeria is just there to ensure that standard is made. So it's common when we buy fire extinguishers, iron and the rest, it's common to see standard organization of, uh, standard of, standard organization of Nigeria logo placed on that product with the scientific code. That is to show you that, okay, that product is of standard. It has been certified by the Standard Organization of Nigeria. So once you are running a business that has to do with manufacturing or you are importing manufacturing products that are within the inventory of products that are to be certified by Standard Organization of Nigeria, then you need to be certified by the Standard Organization of Nigeria. Because once, once you do that, it enhances the value of your product in the market. Because 
it boosts it boosts the customer's confidence once he sees standard organization of nigeria standard organization of nigeria logo on that particular product because you say okay that particular product has been certified by the standard organization of nigeria so i think the standard is good but when you fail to do that people will be skeptical people will be skeptical of uh of of saying of of maybe buying the product or will buy it but in the end they will be skeptical that ah, this product is not even certified by the standard organization of Nigeria. So some of the statutory function of the standard organization of Nigeria include to investigate the quality of facilities, materials, and products in Nigeria and establish a quality assurance system, including certification of factories, products, and laboratories to ensure reference standards. They also ensure reference standards for calibration and verification of measures to compile an inventory of products requiring uh, standardization and other things and it's normal for you to see officials of the standard organization raiding markets and, conf and conf confiscating products that are substandard and if your your product is not certified with them they confiscate it and you know in the end it's destruction so this is some of the functions of the organization so once you are into the production of uh uh any product that is within their inventory to certify then you need to go to the sun office if you are in abuja you know their office is located somewhere at zone seven where you get the guidelines for for doing such certification then we have registration with navdac uh while discussing uh standard organization of nigeria i made mention of some categories of products that are exclusively for NAVDA to administer. So basically, NAVDA has the mandate for controlling, maintaining the distribution, advertising, exportation, importation, manufacture, and the registration of categories of products such as foods, drugs, medical devices, and cosmetics. So if you check, especially when it comes to that medical devices, these are things that that we cannot uh, rule out the fact that standard organization can certify. Uh, so I don't, there's possibility of conflict on, okay, should it be NAVDAC or should it be standard organization of Nigeria that should certify that, but we should be guided by their inventory and product. So all businesses dealing in food and in food and related products are subject to regulation by NAVDAC as it is the law, it is unlawful to unmarket, to market any drugs or consumable goods in the market to the public without registration with NAFTAC. Same with standard organization, you know, there's due to campaign and this awareness, people sub, in our subconscious, is, we know that in our subconscious, we know that if you want to buy a drug or anything, we do check for NAFDA registration number. So if you want to go into the production of drugs or any of the category of products that is uh, administered by NAFDA, then you need to register with NAFDA because that will give the consumer confidence that, that this particular product that he's buying or drug he's buying is authentic. He's not buying a fake something. So once you do not you've not registered your product with uh, nafta you know that one they will confiscate such and destroy it so nafta registers uh, different categories of products which includes the following the what are the categories of products that are registered by nafta we have food and water drugs and medical devices uh, device devices we have herbals and cosmetics uh, vaccines and uh, biologics, chemicals, veterinary products, and narcotics. All these are administered by NAFDA. So if you're into the production of such uh, of products, then you know that these are products that are within the inventory of NAFDA and within the purview of NAFDA to administer. So you need to register with NAFDA. So what we will do now, we'll look at the uh, registration with NAFDA, the procedure of registration with NAFDA. Basically, what I did here is to give the key requirements. It's just a key requirement because for details on guidelines, because there are inventories of how to go about the different uh, 
registration of different products with, with NAVDAC. So what I did there is just to bring out the key requirements for such registration, be it for imported or locally manufactured products. And what I did, I, I mixed the two together. In the course of explanation, I will get to be telling you this is applicable when it is uh, imported. This uh, is not applicable when it's locally manufactured. So basically, do the specific documentation vary for different drugs and food categories. The general procedure is similar and broadly is a two-stage uh, is a two-stage process, which is first application for approval to bring in samples. That is when you are importing that product. Then application for full registration of product applies whether locally or imported. So application to bring in sample when you're importing, then application for registration of product, be it local or imported. Then um, as you can see on the slide, for details on the registration and the rest, you can go to, if you're in Abuja, the head office is at zone seven. Zone seven, there you get to find their office and you get to get the details. But, uh, the purpose of this class let's look at these key requirements what are the key requirements the key requirements are as follows for drugs application is on a single product basis when i say application is on a single product basis what i'm saying is that when if you are let's say you are producing sachet water and you are producing uh biscuits you cannot apply for registration uh, uh, that you cannot apply that now that should issue one registration number for the biscuits and sachet water. It has to be different application for the sachet water, different application for the biscuits. So its application is on a single product basis. An application stating the name of the manufacturer and name of the product. So in your application, you have to state the manufacturer and the name of the product. If you are importing, you state the name of the manufacturer and the product. And the, um, uh, that is the manufacturer could be a big brand like Pfizer. So you have to state that too. Then you complete uh, the NAVDA uh, application form, certificate of incorporation with corporate affairs commission. If it is a company, if you are importing from a company, or if it is a company that is going into the production in Nigeria, you need to attach your certificate of incorporation with the CAC. Then five copies of your product dossier. When I say five copies of your product dossier, basically it means the collection of the various document and data, including data and regulatory documentation concerning research, development, safety, and efficacy of the licensed product, three packs of the product samples, so these are the key requirements. One, if you want to uh, like apply to NAVDA for your drug to be registered, then a notarized original copy of the duly executed power of attorney from the product manufacturer. So basically power of attorney is just a document stating that you are authorizing someone to do something in your state, in your own state something that you can do you are telling you are, you are by the virtue of that document which is uh, named or tagged power of Anthony you are saying that that person can act on your behalf so in the, in this context when it comes to, uh, if you want to apply to NAVDA for registration of drug let's say uh, you are importing the drug from India and the manufacturer in India is Pfizer Pfizer will need to give you a power of attorney stating that they have given you the power to deal with the drug as you so wish. Then they will give that. So it's that particular document that is giving you the authority to import that document and other powers called power of attorney that you need to notarize before. You need to authorize it before. You need to authorize that document and you attach it to your application with NAVDA before your application can also be considered. So when we talk of notarization is basically, if, if you know, there are people in Nigeria we call notary public. So like you are authenticating that document to say that this document is genuine. 
So when we say uh, notarized, you are simply saying that that document is genuine. So the notarization could be done by the Nigerian embassy or Nigerian mission in that country, manufacturing where the manufacturer is based. In the absence of a Nigerian mission or Nigerian embassy, you can approach a British High Commissioner where there is no ECOWAS country mission, which will authenticate such power of attorney or certificate of manufacturer issued by a competent health regulatory agency. In the absence of a power of attorney, they can also issue a contract manufacture, uh, contract manufacturing agreement. So such contract manufacturing agreement, maybe the company is saying they want to come into Nigeria and in partnership with the company or giving, uh, there's what we call franchising. Maybe they are franchising to another company to manufacture the product in Nigeria and you happen to be part of that company or something. That manufacture, contract manufacturing agreement to has to be executed and notarized by a, a notary public, uh, by a notary public in that country or that country where the manufacturer is based. Then current world or health organization manufacturing practice certificate for the man, authenticated by the Nigerian mission, certificate of pharmaceutical uh, product duly issued and authenticated then current pretended pharmacies license to practice issued by you. Because we, you know, uh, NAFDAQ is not just consigned with the manufacture, but it's also the distribution. And you know, pharmaceutical, uh, if you are running a pharmacy, you know, you need to register with NAFDAQ. If you intend to advertise, it's also the responsibility of NAFDAQ to also regulate this thing. So that's why we have this requirement when it comes to application for drug uh, to, for registration with NAFTA. And then we have premises registration. We have certificate of registration of brand name with trade, uh, trademark registry in the ministry. Let's say Pfizer, you know Pfizer, their trademark is well known. So for, for that trademark, it has to be registered in Nigeria. So in, 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 in submitting your application to NAFTA, NAFTA will request for such trademark uh, uh, registration from Ministry of Commerce. So if you're attaching, especially when it's a brand name, that's why I'm using, for instance, Pfizer now. You want to manuf uh, you want to import their product or you want to go into an agreement of manufacture with them. So you must, uh, you must register their trademark in Nigeria and you must attach that certificate of registration then letter of invitation from manufacturer to inspect factory. That is, if the factory is abroad, you have to attach that, then you pay the applicable fee. But bef um, of recent, NAFDAQ just introduced uh, an e-registration procedure, an e-registration procedure for the purpose of registering your products with them. And this e-registration procedure I'm going to just discuss the e-registration briefly. This e-registration procedure, they call it the NAFDAQ Automated Product Administration and Monitoring System, NAPAS. So by use of that, you can go online to register your product with NAFDAQ. You first of all go to www.napas.org. You log in, you sign in as, as a client, you sign up because you need to sign up first before signing in. After you've entered your details, then after you've signed up with them, you decide to bring up the kind of application you want to do based on the, their products, the, the categories of products they, they administer. Then it's left for you to choose which one you want to register. Then you enter all the necessary particulars then after you enter all the necessary particulars, I get there is a means where you get to attach all the documents you need to attach. Then you pay the necessary fees. Then you obtain your registration certificate. Though I don't know how efficient the process is because it's just, I guess it was in June, in July, in July, they introduced this new system of registration. So if you go to www.napas.org, you get to see this 
e-registration system introduced by NAFDAQ for registering of, of products. Then now we are going to discuss the types of business organizations, uh, business and the legal implication of the various types. So by the time we're done discussing this, you know what kind of business organization you are running. If you are not running any, you know what type of business organization you are meant to register. Or if you intend to go into any business, which business organization you register. And for the purpose of this uh, topic, I'll be using uh, the Johnson Business Ventures as an example. And I'll be using Johnson and Johnson Limited as examples. So when we say business organization, we are simply talking of a legitimate, get the key, legitimate venture to make profit. The legitimate venture to make profit. It must not be an illegitimate venture. It must be a legitimate venture to make profit. What are the various types of business organizations? We have the sole proprietorship, we have the partnership, and we have the company. So we are going to discuss this in details now. So we have the sole proprietorship and its legal implication. As the name implies, uh, sorry, as the name implies, the sole owner, sole proprietorship. So is the sole owner of the business. He can do and undo. He decides, he enjoys the profit alone. He makes decisions alone. He, if he dies, the company dies with him. So you are a sole proprietor. If you don't have any partner, you don't intend to have shareholders, you are just running the business alone, then you are a sole proprietorship. So, the, so what are the implications, legal implications of running sole proprietorship? Once you are a sole owner, it's like you are personally liable for the debt and liabilities of the business. For instance, Mr. Johnson runs uh, Johnson Business Venture as a sole proprietor, and he goes ahead to borrow money from GT Bank. So if GT Bank are coming for their money, where he fails to pay that loan, definitely GP Bank, uh, GT Bank would have written to Mr. Johnson severally that pay, pay, demand, they must have written to him several demand letters demanding payment of their money where he feels to do that i believe gt will go to bank get judgment and come and enforce judgment once they get the job if they want to enforce it if they are going after mr johnson they will go after his personal belongings they will go after his cars his house anything they can lay his anything that is carrying the name mr johnson they will go after it Anything that is carrying Mr. Johnson, they will go after it. Mr. Johnson is sole proprietor. That's why we say sole proprietor is personally liable for the debt and liabilities of the business. His personal assets like car, Mr. Johnson's personal assets like car, properties, house, may be seized to offset that debt or of the business. So even though he's trading in the name style of Johnson Business Venture, that does not separate him from his business. He's one, they are one, he's one with his business, with Johnson Business Venture, unlike companies which we will look at subsequently and limited partnership, which I'll discuss now. Then once, you know, in if you register with CAC, you know, company, business name, business name, even if you are running a sole proprietorship and you register with the CAC, that does not uh, separate you from the business because you are registering as a sole proprietorship. What the benefits that accrue to you registering with CAC does not including, uh, does not include separating you from the business. Only when we talk about company, you get to know what we'll, we'll be talking about legal personality, artificial persons in law. So in the case of sole proprietorship, even though you register that company with CAC, it does not become uh, an artificial person. If Mr. Johnson decides to register his, uh, his Johnson Business Ventures with CAC, that Johnson Business Venture does not become a legal uh, person. That is, it, not a, it does not acquire a legal personality from the sole owner. If that business name, Johnson Ventures, 
Johnson Business Venture is still the same with Mr. Johnson. Then we have partnership. When we see partnership, you know, is when two or more persons come together to run a legitimate business venture. So partnership can be general, it can be limited. So what is, when we say someone is running limited partnership or some people are running limited partnership, what do we mean? When we say some people are running, or when we say some people are limited partners, what do we mean? When we say some people are general partners, what do we mean? So except in the case of partners who are limited partners, general partners have unlimited liabilities to similar to a sole proprietor. So once you decide to go into partnership and all the partners decide they want to be general partners in the sense that they want to partake in the day-to-day -day running of the business, they want to be actively involved in the running of the business. When every decision is taken, they want to be involved. Then such partners are said to be general partners. And in such a case, their liabilities are unlimited. Just as we discussed with sole proprietor, with a sole proprietor. So the legal implication is similar to general partners. Their personal assets can be... Uh, their personal assets too will, will be ceased to offset that particular debt and the liabilities of that partnership business once you decide to run a general uh, partnership. That's why here is, I, it's written, general partners are at risk of having their personal belonging ceased to offset the debts and liabilities of the partnership business because a business made up of two or more partners is sharing the business uh, because it's a business made up of two or more partners, each sharing the business's debts. Oh, this thing is wrong, sorry. Should be, this S should not be there. Businesses are uh, debts, liabilities, and assets. A, in the case of a limited partnership, a limited partnership is when two or more people come uh, to uh, decide that they want to run a business. The one of the partners says he doesn't want to be actively involved in the running of the business, then that partner is regarded as a limited partner. He only wants to invest in that business. So his liability is limited to his investment. His liability is limited to his investment. When you decide to go into a limited partnership, that's why here I, I wrote a limited partnership exists when two or more partners go into business together. But one or more of the partners, when one or more are only liable up to the amount of the of investment in the partnership. So let's say Mr. Johnson and Mr. John decides to decide to go into partnership. So once uh, and then Mr. John approaches Mr. Johnson and said, I want to be a limited partner. I don't want to be involved in the day-to-day -day running of the business. So by so doing, Mr. John now is a limited partner. Once uh, the, 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 the partnership business indebted to any organization. If the organization is to go after the partners, it will not go after the personal belongings of Mr. John, because Mr. John is just a limited partner, or rather it will only go after his investment in the business. But as for Mr. Johnson, who is involved in the day-to-day -day activity of the, of the, of the business, the bank or the whatever organization they borrowed the money from can go after his personal belongings, seize it to offset the debt and liabilities. And the determination of who is a partner in a business is whether the person partakes in profit sharing. So once Mr. John or you and other persons decide to go into partnership, you have to decide that uh, you partake in the profit sharing. If you don't partake in that profit sharing, then you don't consider yourself a partner in that business. So these are the legal implications of running partnership, be it limited or uh, general partnership. Then we look at company. Like if you can recall with sole proprietorship, I raised the issue of legal personality. So let's say Mr. Johnson decides that, okay, he's tired of running Johnson business ventures. He wants a company now. He wants to incorporate Johnson and Johnson Limited. He says he's tired of running uh, Johnson 
business ventures he wants to upgrade to he wants to incorporate a company johnson and johnson limited or he wants to upgrade the business name to johnson and johnson limited so from the day that company johnson and johnson limited and a certificate of incorporation is issued to him he becomes that johnson and johnson becomes an artificial person in law Johnson and Johnson acquires Johnson and Johnson Limited acquires a corporate legal personality. It is a separate human being from Mr. Johnson, unlike sole proprietorship and general partners. You get it. So by so doing, Mr. Johnson is no longer one with Johnson and Johnson Limited. Johnson and Johnson Limited is now an artificial person in law. In law, it will, be, it, it will be regarded as a person. So Mr. Johnson is a natural person, while Johnson & Johnson Limited is an artificial person in law. So shareholders, so uh, Johnson & Johnson Limited will get to have its shareholders, will get to have its, its, its directors. So, so we look at subsequently, what are the implications? So but now Mr. Johnson cannot be said to be one with Johnson & Johnson Limited because in law, in the eyes of the law now, Johnson & Johnson Limited is a person. So the personal asset of the shareholders, unlike in, the, unlike in sole proprietorship and general partnership, the ads, uh, unlike in sole proprietorship and in partnership where the as, uh, assets of partners can be seized, in the case of a company, especially now Johnson & Johnson Limited, registered by Mr. Johnson, where the company is indebted to any person or any company or any bank, the company cannot go after Mr. Johnson because Mr. Mr. Johnson is not one with Johnson and Johnson Limited. Johnson and Johnson Limited has acquired its, has acquired its own legal personality. It's not an artificial person. It's not a company. That's the company being a human being of its own can do the following in its registered name. So instead of Mr. Johnson buying a property in his name, he can buy it in the name of Johnson and Johnson Limited. Instead of entering a comp uh, into a contract in his name, he can enter it with Johnson and Johnson Limited. Instead of suing a company or any person with his name, he can sue that person in the name of Johnson and Johnson Limited. Uh, and Johnson and Johnson Limited will enjoy perpetual succession. That means it lives forever. It can apply for loan in its registered in its registered name. For instance, let me use uh, First Bank, for instance. You know, if you check the logo of First Bank, it carries since 1959. Uh, you can't say First Bank has been, uh, those the initial shareholders of First Bank are still alive or the initial directors of First Bank are still alive. But because from the day of incorporation of First Bank, it became a legal personality. It became an artificial person. That's why First Bank can live forever. The shareholders will come and go, directors will come and go, but First Bank will live forever. So, so um, Johnson & Johnson Limited can live forever because Mr. Johnson has decided to register Johnson & Johnson Limited as a company. Is separate from him. If the bank wants to go after their money, is any asset that is bought in the name of Johnson and Johnson Limited that the bank will go after. So it's common for you to see a C of O coming out in the name of a company, or you see um, agreements being written in the name of companies. Because why these companies are artificial persons, they are regarded separate from their owners, from their shareholders. So we've discussed the various business organizations and its legal implication. So I hope from what I have said, you have a basic understanding of sole proprietorship, partnership, big general and limited, and now company. So we are going to see registration of business and non-business organizations. Why register your business? Registration of business is done at the Corporate Affairs Commission, as I have said 
so many times, whether it be the business name or a company incorporation. Any business, whether small or large, will in the long run benefit from corporate physical, physical and product registration. So the benefit of regist registering your business, the at ways the, the, the disadvantages of not registering. Because once your business is registered, you get to do some official transactions such as borrowing of money from the bank and you get to benefit from certain incentives that will be presented by the federal government, like the survival fund disposed by the federal government. One, if your business is not registered, two, you don't pay tax, there is no way you can benefit from such incentives from the federal government. That is why it's important you register your business uh, with the federal government. For, for instance, with the CAC, for instance, when you go to countries like England, you know, during this lockdown period due to the COVID-19, the, the government has rolled out several policies for the purpose of, 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 of mitigating the, the harshness or the effect of the, of the pandemic on small and medium enterprise. So if, for instance, a business in England is not registered and is not paying tax, that particular business is not should not be expecting to benefit from such rollouts by government, even though in Nigeria we don't experience such much. But the little now, the survival fund, other things that government is trying to do to ensure that businesses it is the the the, the hardship of the, the the pandemic or due to losses experienced by business through the pandemic if you don't register your business there is no way you can benefit from such incentives then registration to is also important social responsibility both from a legal and moral angle because it's your obligation to pay tax once you are running a business so register the business so that you can be captured within the tax net of the federal government so that you can pay your tax your products too where they are unregistered it becomes a problem because a consumer where he sees a product and it's supposed to be certified by the standard organization of nigeria or by it's supposed to carry a navdag registration number and there is not uh there is neither a certification by standard organization of Nigeria and where the product is supposed to be registered with NAVDAC is not registered. You don't expect that consumer to be to be in a hurry to purchase such products. So it's very important, aside from registering with the CAC, you register with other relevant uh, regulatory agencies that have the mandate to regulate that product you are entering into. And then we have the small business startup procedure. The small business startup procedure. So you don't have a business. You are thinking of starting a business. This is just a small business startup procedure. I'm going to just give you a briefly. Find a suitable business name to suit your business idea, which is important. If you are into production of water, the name should be similar so that it's easier for people to identify that, okay, this person is into the business of uh, uh, production of water. Is it production of chairs? This person is into the business of production of chairs. So the name should be a suitable name. Then identify suitable business location. It's very important where you get customers, where you get people to patronize whatever services or product you are offering to them. So these are assessments you need to do before you go into a business. Then register the business with CAC. Make sure you choose a name that's easy to pronounce, remember, and has a relationship with the type of the business. So after you've gotten a suitable business name, suitable location, then the next thing to do is you register with CAC, you value added tax, register with your with with uh, with Federal Inland Revenue Service for you to remit your your VAT. Then you have register where if you are going into production of a product that falls within the categories of products that are administered by NAVDAC, then you need to register with NAVDAC where you need to certify with standard organization of Nigeria. You need to do that. 
So once you do that, you are you to your confidence as a businessman will be and your morale will be very high because you know you've met all the requirements and you are paying your taxes nobody can approach you and say ah, you are not paying tax or you've not registered your product or you've not certified your product to standard organization of nigeria to warrant them classificating such products so uh, basically this is it about the uh, small business startup procedure then this is uh, an important part of this lecture. Procedure and documents to be submitted to CAC for registration of business name. If you can recall earlier, we earlier we discussed registration of a business name. We talked about uh, the fact that if you are running a sole proprietorship, you can register it as a business name with CAC once you register it with CAC, there is now you are now within the tax net and all those benefits we said you enjoy once you register with CAC, you get to enjoy them when federal government is rolling out such incentives so if you want to register you are running a sole proprietorship now for instance or you are running a business but you don't want to reg register it as a company or you are running a partnership which you are into the production of a product but you don't want to register that partnership as a as 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 as, as a company or a limited liability partnership uh, by the way limited liability partnership was just recently introduced by virtue of the amendment of karma so csc are yet to implement and make provision for the registration of such in Nigeria for now. But once they begin it, they will have to make adjustment to this lecture to include it. But legal limited liability partnership is also like partners are not liable past past stand for any debt of the company and the rest. But right now, what we are discussing is registration uh, procedure and documents to be submitted to CC for registration of a business name. Okay, before we discuss preservation of name, I want to bring it to your notice that there are four sets and categories of people that can register with CAC. CAC has accredited agents. These accredited agents are, are people that can be accredited as agents with CAC, rather are a lawyer, a chartered accountant, a chartered secretary. These are people that can register with CEC to become accredited agents. So once you are an accredited agent with CEC, they will issue you a, a, an identity card to that effect. Like for instance, I'm a lawyer and I'm, I'm an accredited agent with the CEC. So by virtue of that accreditation, you have a portal then the fourth category of person, the fourth category or the, the next persons in line that can register the company with CAC are the individuals or owners of that companies. Let's say, for instance, Mr. Johnson doesn't want to use any of the accredited agents, but he, he wants to register it himself. He can do it. But the problem is registering it yourself there are some procedures that you are not familiar with. And there are some signatures that there are some stamps and uploading you need to do that you are not familiar with, which we will discuss as we are discussing this. So once you are, you've, you, you logged on to CAC website, you go to the, uh, you could just Google Corporate Affairs Commission on the net you click on it to direct you to their website. From their website, you will see where you get to do registration. So once you go to registration, you, you, you as a proprietor, it will make provisions for that. But as, as for, for instance, me as an accredited agent, I will just go to my, my portal. I will just enter the name. But as for you, you have to sign up. You have to do some registration first before you can commence your as the owner of the business you can only register your business you cannot register another person's business 
only accredited agents can register other people's business but you you can only register only your business so you submit the name to cac for approval and any name you are submitting to cac in the course of submitting the name they will tell you the name must not be similar with a name in use it must not be a name in use you must not use the name chamber of commerce if there are names that are carrying like for instance abuja you need to obtain the consent of the abuja municipal council before using that name abuja because using that name abuja you are portraying that that product or services you are offering is associated with abuja so that is why it's important when you are choosing a name don't choose name like chamber of commerce and the rest except you apply for consent there are certain names that are restricted and then you have to apply for consent with cac from the registrar general once he grants his consent then you can proceed so once you enter the name two things will happen either the name will be approved or the name will be rejected or will be denied and they will give you reason for denying the name but if the name is approved they are going to give you a code a code which you proceed to your reg your registration so once you enter the code it's going to bring out a form for you to fill so is this form now containing personal details of proposed proprietors because it's a business name you're registering what you have are proprietors not the directors not shareholders so proposed directors to state the nature of the business the information information page of the national identity card or driver's license or voter's card or international passport of the proprietor so once you enter your details the nature of the business your address once you go to the form you see that or if you are using an accredited agent he will ask you for such information which you and he will enter on your behalf and he will do the follow-up for you and the rest though you also charge you for his professional fee and the rest then you need either your national identity card driver's license voter's card or international passport any of these means of identification will serve for the purpose of registering a business name then you need a two passport size photograph of the proprietors where you have more than one proprietor proprietors then you need to submit the evidence of of payments after you've entered all your necessary information then you make payment after making payment on the portal there's a provision for payment on the portal through remitter after you've made your payment then you get to download the forms once you download the purpose of downloading the forms is for you to sign so once you sign you sign the forms then you upload it back there's a provision for uploading the forms back so once you upload the forms the the commission will look at your application they will look at the forms and look at the documents you attach if there is no query then your comp the business name will be approved but where there is query what they will do they will ask you to rectify that mistake you made in your application and re-upload again so that is basically the procedure and documents to be submitted to CAC for registration of business name. So once you register, once you submit it, they will go through it, they will approve it, they will send you an RC number to email, and they will ask you to come pick up your CAC certificate at any accredited uh, career service that has been accredited by the CAC. You go there, you pay, you pick up your 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 certificate as all you register the company and one thing you need to know about uh, uh, approval of name once a name is approved by cac is reserved for 60 days so you have 60 days to do your registration 60 days to do reg to do registration to the point of payment because once you pay the 60 days stops counting. But if you fail to pay your 60 days, at the expiration of that 60 days, you lost the name and you will lose, or if you, you began your registration, you also lose that registration. Example of business names are Taiwan, Taiwan Co, Global Ventures Farm and ETC. Then we're going to discuss procedure and documents uh, to be submitted to CAC for registration of a company. So 
but A of karma deals with company, but B deals with business name, but C deals with incorporated trustee. So if you want to register a company, this karma that was recently passed into law says one director, one shareholder suffices for you to register a private limited company. But uh, CAC as the guardian of karma has not begun implementing such provisions in the 2020. It's still the old karma that is still being implemented. That is, sorry, that is still being used. They've not begun implementing the new karma. So once you want to start a business and you want to register a company, there are different types of company. We have private limited company. We have a public limited company. We have an unlimited company. We have company limited by guarantee. So a company uh, unlimited by guarantee. So these companies are there, but for the purpose of this lecture and purpose of this class, we'll be discussing, we'll focus majorly on private limited company because we know that we are dealing with people that are into, want to go into small businesses or intend to go into small businesses. However, if you want to register a private limited company, you must have at least two shareholders use going by the old karma, which is being, which is still in, uh, in use by CAC, at least two shareholders, their maximum of 50 shareholders, but for unlimited companies, at least two to unlimited numbers, which PLC at the end of the day. Public limited companies are usually quoted at the stock exchange market and are highly regulated by the Securities Exchange Commission. Private limited company is more suited for small and medium businesses. As I said, the private limited company is more suited for small, small and medium businesses. So once you have decided that, okay, I want to register, and the fact that you begin with private limited company, and let's say the company is growing, is growing, is growing, and you want to auction your, you want to become public so that the public can be able to buy shares in your company, where you register a private company, that doesn't stop you from upgrading to a public limited company or a public, yes, you can still upgrade to a public limited company. So once you've decided the, the, the name of the company, the environment and everything, then you submit the name, just like business name, it has to be an accredited agent or any of the direct uh, shareholders or directors in the company, then you there is provision for which you enter for that purpose. But as an accredited agent, I will just log into my portal, enter the company name, and just like business name, the company name must not be a restricted name. It must not be a name that is in use. It must not be a name that is similar to another name. It must be a name, unique name that unique name that will be unique to you alone. So CAC will look at the name. If it doesn't fall into the exceptions of names that will not be approved, it will approve the name for you for 60 days. For instance, let's say Johnson and Johnson, Mr. Johnson submits Johnson and Johnson Limited. If there is no Johnson and Johnson Limited or a name similar to Johnson and Johnson Limited, then CAC will approve that name for Mr. Johnson and reserve the name for 60 days. So 60 days on until the point of payment. So once you do, you fill all the necessary information, informations like who the directors of the company will be, their surname, their means of, you enter their, their number on their means of identity, uh, means of identification, be it national identity cards, driver's license or voters or international passport. You enter their necessary details like uh, addresses, age and the rest then you go to shareholders to you enter their their names and the rest so the form once your the name is approved they will give you a code by entering that code it will bring out a, on the portal it will bring out a form for you you fill so once you fill that forms and you enter an object objects of the company that will come out in the form of your memorandum 
of association. Then there is also articles of association that will be adopted that you can adopt that of CAC or you can decide to upload your own bet. It's advisable you adopt that of CAC. Subsequently, you can amend. And moreover, that of CAC is, is more concise. I am brief. The where your business is growing and the rest, you can decide to amend your articles of association or your memorandum of association. Memorandum of association normally carries the object of the company. What do you intend to use the company for? So you enter all the details your secretary, all this for a private limited company or public limited company. After you enter such information, you now make payment. After paying, you download the forms because you need to download the forms for the directors and the shareholders to sign. There is a provision for signing the documents for of incorporation. So after they've signed all the necessary documents, then you will need to, to get uh, a notary public or commissioner for oath to stamp on that document. After he has stamped, then you need that means of identification. You will need to photocopy it, the photocopies. Then you upload together the photocopies together with the uh, documents of incorporation. So you are going to upload everything on CAC's portal. So after you've uploaded, CAC will go through it. We'll see, we'll check, we'll check. Once there is no query, they, they will proceed to, to approve your registration. Once, once the name is approved, then they will give you your RC number. They will tell you when to go and pick up your document. So that's it with the uh, uh, procedure and documents to be submitted to CAC for registration of company. It's, it's, it's not as easy as I'm speaking. You say, okay, you just go and do. it's not that easy sometimes. So that's why some, that's why CC decides to make provision for, for agents to help you do that. But where you feel you can do it yourself, you can go ahead and do it. Because if you don't do it properly, one, you delay, you don't know the procedure, you delay the incorporation of the company. They will, once, if they give you, you find it, you find it difficult to resolve the query on time and the rest. So if you can do it yourself, you can go ahead and do it. Nobody will stop you. So this is just a rough estimate of fees of registration of companies under Karma, under Part A of Karma. This is not the exact fee because fee is something that is subject to uh, policy. So it can change everything. As I can tell you, uh, registration of private company with 1 million shares now is not one uh, 10,000 year away. But for the purpose of this class, we just gave an estimation. So once you want to do the registration, if you want to do it yourself or when you contact uh, an agent, you get to you get to know how much the exact registration fee is. So uh, let's, let me take you back to companies. So if you want to register your company, there's this thing we call share capital. Share capital of a company. The share capital can be 1 million share capital, can be 2 million share capital. Does not mean you are going to pay CAC 1 million naira or 2 million naira. That is just an artificial valuation of your company. You are telling CAC that your company is worth 1 million naira and you intend to have 1 million shares of ordinary uh, uh, 1 million ordinary shares, which you would divide among the shareholders. It can be, you might have 1 million ordinary shares and you have two shareholders. So in that case, you decide to share the, the, uh, the, the, the shares to 250,000 ordinary shares, 250,000 ordinary shares to the different share shareholders. So, this is it about registration of business name. So our final topic is law of contract. So once we are done with uh, this topic, we are done for today. So what is contract? When we are talking of contract, we are talking of an ex. So what do we even need to discuss contracts? Because contract, basically, you need to have a basic idea. Maybe after this lecture, you get to know that your day-to-day -day activities of buying uh, bread and dress are contract, entering taxes, boarding taxes, 
and other means of transportation. These are contracts you are entering into. So basically, a contract is an enforceable legal obligation agreed upon. That means there must be an agreement between the parties. That in law we say consensus at Adam. That means parties must be in consensus. If parties are not in consensus, then there is no contract. And it must be enforceable. The contract must be an enforceable one and it must be legal. So these elements must be present for you to say you're having a contract. So what are the basic elements of a contract? The basic elements of contract are offer, acceptance, consideration. And when we say offer, offer in this sense is using Mr. Johnson and Mr. John, for instance. Offer is, let's say, Mr. Johnson approaching Mr. John, offering to sell his Mercedes Benz, that is offer. Offer can be in another form. When you go to supermarkets, you will see them displaying their products on the shelf. In law, law of contract, that is called invitation to treat. That displays invitation to treat. You carrying that product and meeting the cashier, is that is you making offer to making offer to the uh, to the supermarket that you want to buy their product and the cashier accepting your money that is acceptance and consideration as exchange offer to can be let's say you want to board a taxi in boarding a taxi you normally for example for instance you, you stand on the road you are waiting for the taxi so once you stand that is invitation to treat the taxi is stopping for you that is offer you entering that is acceptance so you can see offer can take various forms. It's not always somebody bringing something to you. In contracts too, you see uh, invitation to tender. They are inviting people to tender. So you, that invitation to tender is not government <coughs> making offer to you. It's when you bring your tenders to government to be awarded contract, you are making an offer to government. So in contract, there must be offer. Anyway it goes, there must be offer. Then you have acceptance. So once you, you make an offer, there must be an acceptance. If there is no acceptance, then there can be contract. If Mr. Johnson approaches Mr. John that he wants to sell his BMW and Mr. John said he's not interested, then we cannot move forward and say we want to go ahead with the contract because in the first place, there is no acceptance. And even where there is acceptance, there must be consideration. And when we say consideration, a thing of value must exchange hand. So, Mr. John must pay for the car to, to, for us to say there, there is a contract. Let's say he agrees to pay the money instrumentally and the car is going for 50,000 Naira and he decides to pay 5,000 Naira as part payment. That is consideration in law and there is contract because these are the basic elements of contracts. These are the basic elements of acceptance consideration. Then we'll look at the form. Form two is another uh, thing that will determine whether your contract is valid or not. Contracts can be in writing, can be in conduct, and it can be oral. Uh, for instance, let me give you an example of a contract by orally. You talking to somebody, a taxi, for instance, when you stop, he stops by the road, or you, by, you are standing by the road, the taxi is passing, then you shout, uh, you are going to, from from who say you want to go to beggar and you said beggar he stops you ask him how much he tells you the amount you enter that form of contract is oral then contract can be by conduct i can just be standing on the street then a taxi man will, will be passing then he'll stop i will not say anything i'll just board the vehicle i will not say anything once we reach, because um, I know that from this spot to that spot, this is where I want to stop or bus stop. Once he stops there, I will drop and then I'll give him his 15 Naira or 100 Naira, whatever the price is. That is contract by conduct. By conduct of parties, already there is a contract. Then written, which is common, where parties will write down that these are the terms of the contract and all these things they will sign, execute, and all this in this contract 
So if the contract is it either be oral conduct or in writing, so you have a contract. Then we have capacity. If for you to enter into contract, the person must have the capacity to enter into such contract. Capacity in the sense that in terms of age, that person must be of age to enter that contract. For instance, in, in Nigeria, we don't have a, a particular age, like a law saying that, it, that this is the age of which a person can be said to be an adult. But we know from election and the rest, uh, driving, they'll say 18 years. So let's, for instance, let's say they are entering into a contract with a, a child who is under the age of 18. The law will consider that, that contract illegal because the child is not of the capacity to enter that contract. But however, there is a case that has been decided that says where a child enters into a contract of necessity, where it affects his necessity, where it is like food, clothing, something that is of necessity to him, that contract is said to be illegal. So you cannot even enter a contract with somebody that is mentally challenged, except at his lucid period. That is if he has a lucid period, that is those period which is not experiencing mental problem that you can reason with him and you can talk to him. If at that period you entered into a contract with him, but it has to be established that he has lucid period. Then in such a case, such contracts are legal. Then contract must be legal. You cannot go and enforce illegal contract. And for instance, a prostitute suing somebody that is supposed to pay her 500,000 naira because uh, she slept with him and she said she decides to go to court. Such a contract is un unenforceable because up initial that contract is illegal. It cannot be enforced. Also, uh, uh, like for instance, a politician asking talks to go and steal ballot box, then on the promising them that he's going to pay them 50,000. After they've, uh, They've, 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 uh, after they, they've snatched the ballot box, he ended up paying them 10,000 naira. So in that, that case, such contract is illegal up initial. So they cannot say they want to go to, to, to court to enforce such contract. So contract must be legal and there must be intention to create legal obligation. There must be that intention. Parties must have that intention that they want to go into that contract. In absence of that will make that contract to be null and, null and void. So this, once these elements are present, then we are said to, we, we have a valid contract. Then we are going to look at privity of contract. Privity of contract. Well, so privity of contract simply means uh, only parties to a contract can sue. It's a principle of law that says only parties to a contract. Uh, let me use the example of Mr. John and Mr. Johnson. Where Mr. Johnson offered to sell his car to Mr. John, and he sold the car to Mr. John, and apparently the car, contrary to the uh, to what was said by Mr. Johnson, that the car is in good shape, that the engine is perfect then mr john discovered that the engine is not perfect and then Miss, Miss, mrs john decides to sue mr johnson for breach of contract in that case the law will not will not hear the case of mrs john because she's not a, when the parties were entering into the contract she was never a party in that contract so she cannot sue mr johnson for that contract because she was never a party however the law makes provisions for exceptions where parties who are not party to a contract can sue. An example of such is contracts uh, run on covenants. That is contracts, um, covenants, um, covenants running with land. For instance, in such a case where there are contracts with covenants running on land, then parties who are not uh, party to the suit or privy to the contract, parties who are not uh, privy to the contract can sue on behalf of parties or where somebody is intervening with someone's right. And you know that uh, you did not enter into any agreement with that person. You can sue that person for interfering with your 
contract with that other person. So these are exceptions to privity of contract. Then when we talk of terms of contract, we're talking of express or implied terms. Express where the terms are stated expressly. Mr. Johnson wants to sell his BMW to Mr. John. So they decide to, to, they decide to write the terms expressly. Everything indicates the car stops on so 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 they are returning in this. So these are express terms that are there. So sometimes parties will not be able to capture everything in, in the contract. So some terms will have to be implied. Let's say Mr. Johnson and Mr. John fail to include that. Uh, uh, maybe at the time of negotiation, they said, it, uh, uh, okay, let's say Mr. John and Mr. Johnson fail to include that the engine must be in perfect good shape. But there's implied time you want to sell a car to somebody. There's this implied time that the engine must be in good shape. That at the time of selling that car to that person, the engine must be in good shape and the stereo and other things must be functioning perfectly, even though it's not expressly stated. Though courts hardly, when you carry breach of contract to court and you present the contract to court, hardly do court impute certain terms that are not expressly stated. That is why when you are entry into contract, it is advised that all terms should be expressly stated because the court will tell you that they don't have the right to impute terms into what parties have decided. So it's advisable for you not to, you are entering into a contract, not to leave any term out. Make sure you include all the terms of the contract. Then what are the elements that can initiate a contract? So once somebody is entering into contract and he enters that contract in, on that duress, that means maybe threat of physical violence on him or any of his relative that will make that person to enter into such contract, then that contract will be reshated. That contract will be reshated <clears throat> up initial because parties are supposed to enter into a contract voluntarily, willingly, not due to any threat or violence to their person. Then we have undue influence. Undue influence is can exist where there is a special relationship. For instance, a, a banker, knowing that he has a, a financial edge over a, a knowledgeable financial edge on how the financial market works, then he influenced somebody to enter into a contract that would be beneficial to him. Because he has a fiduciary uh, duty towards his customer, he used that duty or that influence he has over his customer to make him to enter into that contract so such contracts will be regarded as 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 null and void null and void because he used influence he influenced the person or for instance uh, somebody uh, knowing that mr johnson let me use mr johnson uh, um, his son decided to forge his signature and he went and obtained uh, loan from bank then the bank will come and say okay then the bank discovers that oh so mr johnson's son has been using forging his dad's signature to obtain loan from the bank so the bank manager will just call mr johnson and say see if you don't execute this mortgage in respect of your property i'm going to lodge a complaint with with the police so that your son will be arrested for forgery so you get all these things. So this influence. So in such a case, that contract that he will be entering with the bank, executing uh, a mortgage agreement will make him to foreclose his, 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 uh, his, his mortgage where he fails to pay. In such a case, then, then uh, in such a case, then that contract will be, will be, no and void. Then we have misrepresentation. Misrepresentation here simply means facts. When you misrepresent facts at the time or before or at the time of entering the contract, you on true facts, you, you give out on true facts about the subject matter of the contract. In such a case, that contract will be null and void. Then we have mistake. Mistake is when uh, parties are mistaken as to the subject of the contract. Mistakes in law can be, uh, let's say, uh, mutual in the sense that 
Mr. Johnson has two cars, Mercedes and BMW. And he approaches Mr. John that I want to sell my Mercedes and BMW. But I want the Mercedes to go for 40,000, the BMW for 20,000. Unknown to Mr. John thought is, Mr. Johnson wants to sell the BMW and Mercedes for 40,000 and he pays him 40,000. In such a case, that contract will be null and void because there's mistake on the part of parties as to the money of the subject matter and to what subject matter is involved. So that con contract will be vitiated by mistake. Or let's say that particular car, Mr. Johnson, John has made payment. Then Mr. Johnson is with the car, then the car, or as they were negotiating, or he was about to make payment, or has made, then the car, uh, now, now Mr. Johnson in position of the car has an accident or something, then the subject matter is no longer in existence. Such a contract is null and void. Or let's say they are discussing about a filling station, then that filling station got burned or got destroyed by a storm. So there is a mistake as to the subject matter, or known to them that the subject matter is no longer existing in the course of the negotiation, such a case is a mistake. So there's a mistake in that, such a case. So that, that contract will be initiated. Then we'll discuss discharge of contract. On when can we say contract is discharged? When contracts are performed, we can say contracts are discharged. When parties have performed their obligation of the contract, where uh, Mr. John has paid for the car and Mr. Johnson has given the car to Mr. John, parties have performed their contract. So contract by, can be discharged. When can we say contract is discharged by frustration? When the subject matter is no longer in existence. The example of the filling station and use, they were busy negotiating or they then parties discovered after reaching agreement that the, ah, at the time they were discussing the sale of that filling is no longer in existence. So that contract is discharged by frustration. Where there's a breach to the fundamental when there's a fundamental breach, fundamental breach in the sense that you order for a product, you ordered a iPhone uh, from Conga, then Conga decides to supply, uh, decides to supply a H HTC phone to you. You see there's a breach of the fundamental term of the contract. In such a case, you can ask the, that contract can be rescinded. That means it's no longer uh, valid for such contracts. Such, such contract can be dis is discharged by that breach by Conga not supplying the iPhone you requested or you ordered for mutual agreements in the sense that contracts can be discharged by mutual agreements where parties agree that, okay, uh, even though they have not discharged their obligation, they are no longer interested in completing the contract. So finally, finally, uh, this is the final topic we'll be considering, which is remedies for breach of contract. What will happen when Mr. John has paid uh, the money for the car and Mr. Johnson has failed to, 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 to give him his car? So in such a case, there are remedies available for Mr. John in court, one of which is damages which is my damage is simply monetary compensation. We are asking the court for monetary compensation for that breach. And that monetary compensation can be general, can be specific. It's up to lawyers to know, to decide for you, which you go for. Is it you are going for general damages or you are going for specific damages. Then we have specific performance is another remedy too that is available to a party who has suffered as a result of a breach of contract. So, all these, so this specific performance simply asking the court to ask the other party to complete his obligation that he has begun. That means you are saying that okay, I have started. I've start. He has started. I've, I have performed my own part of the contract. I want the court to make him to perform his own part of the contract. So that is specific performance. Then we have ratification. Ratification is when the court decides to adjust the terms of the contract. Let's say he's supposed to, to, yes, he's supposed to bring a Mercedes, then he brings a BMW. The court can tell Mr. John to take the BMW and pay for that BMW rather than canceling the contract totally. 
injunction is another remedy that, that is available to, to parties when there's a breach. Injunction is simply stopping a person from carrying out an act. You are telling the court to stop that person from doing that. An injunction can be interlocutory, it can be entering, it can be perpetual. So it's left for a lawyer to decide for you which one and at which stage you are going for it if you are approaching the court to enforce, to get remedies for any breach. Then we have quantum merit. Quantum merit means reasonable value of service. That means a person is entitled to consideration for the reasonable value of service he has offered. For instance, a taxi man carrying you from Nuse to Jabi, then the car stops at uh, at Bega, it is expected of you to pay him for that journey from Wednesday to Bega. So that's going to merit. Then we have rescission. Rescission is when parties said they want the court to cancel the contract. They should rescind the contract. They don't even want to go into the contract. So uh, basically, these are the remedies for breach of contract. And we've come to the end of this today's lectures. We've looked at, uh, uh, we started by talking about the objectives. What are the objectives? I believe by now, uh, participants should have the nitty gritty and basics when it comes to all uh, what I, I said were the objectives that we want participants to have a basic understanding of, which is the Nigerian legal system, the legal regime and regulatory agencies regulating businesses in Nigeria, then steps in the formation and registration of business in Nigeria, and understand the basic nature and elements in a commercial contract. I believe participants, when asked a question regarding this, do I not expect you to know everything because these are things that are topics on their own too, but at least you can have a basic idea and reply anybody. So we we'll discuss that, we we'll look at the topics, we we'll look at the real level, the relevant regulate, corporate affairs commission, federal Illinois revenue, registration with, with Sun, registration with NAVDAC. Uh, we looked at the, Registration with NAVDAC. We looked at the um, we look at the key requirements for for registration with NAVDAC when it comes to drug types of business organization and the legal implication of the various types, which is very important. I know by now participants should be able to know what sole proprietorship is, partnership is, and the implication of the various form of uh, business organization, why company stands out and its legal implication, small business startup procedure and rest. So now if you have any observation, uh, question or any, uh, anything you want to ask, now is the time to ask, you unmute yourself and ask your question. Mm. You unmute yourself and ask your question. If you want any clarification or you you want uh, to ask any question, now is the time to do so. Hello, good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you so much for the meeting. Well, okay. 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 Please, if, if you are not, if you are not speaking, uh, mute your mic so that the other person speaking can can speak without you interfering. Sir, can I can I come in? Uh, yes. Okay. All right. Sir, please, uh, in the, I'd like you to put me through in the aspect of uh, the form we are filling. I'd like, to, I'd like to appreciate you for the lecture. I think we so much enjoy your lectures. You're welcome, sir. Thank you, sir. The area I'd like you to put me through is the SWOT analysis. What are they expecting us to 
what are they expecting us to fix in the the first columns strength and weakness of can you put me through if, you are, if you are registering a company with AC, let me get the question no is a is it is the form of form for this uh uh this thing a loan okay okay there will be it's a, a loan form that. there will uh, be a class for that so Okay. When they come to the class, I think the class has been conducted yesterday. Okay, so you direct there was a class on that yesterday. And so you direct your question to the platform on that. So the person that took you on that will answer the question on the platform. It's all right. Mm, yes. Then may, may I equally ask? Can I equally ask mm. that uh, this the loan we are talking about here? Uh, yes, sir. The five percent is it? Is the five percent for the duration of the time you are paying the loan, or is it an annual uh, payment or monthly payment that is attracting five percent of the loan? Well, from my knowledge of the loan, the five percent. I hope you are getting me. I am getting you. It's five percent per annum duration of the loan. Now it should okay. be a duration of the loan. Oh, mm. okay, duration of the loan, not monthly, not annually. No, it's per annum. It's okay. When will you complete your payment now? Five percent of the money. It's all right. Thank you so much, sir. Okay, welcome. But for details, you can post the question on the platform. They will ask, they will ask, they will answer you in details. Just post it. It's all right. Thank you. Bless you, sir. You're welcome. Any question? Any question? Any more questions? Okay, sir. Please le let me ask. Hello, sir. Mm -hmm. I am listening. Are you with me, sir? Yes, sir. All right. Now, is it possible for you to get the 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 lesson uh, note uh, uploaded for us? This one. Yes, this already, very one. It's already on the, on the platform. Okay, I've okay, seen it. After, after the class, after the class, we put it on. After. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm. And it's already it's also on the YouTube. Uh, yes, it's also okay. on YouTube. Mm. It's all right. Thank you, sir. Okay. okay, any other question? Mm. Mr. Christopher, if you need to ask, you need to unmute yourself before you ask your question. Okay. Mr. Christopher is not raising his hand. Okay, you can talk now. I'm listening. You're welcome, sir. Hello, are you doing? I'm um, with you, sir. Your lecture. Thank you, sir. In the future, may one buy a used product. Sir? Oh, you call it uh, to whom? In the future, may one buy a import a used uh, product. Uh, used product. I think in the future, may one buy a imported uh, used product. Hmm. Uh, yes. Does this thing have to go through? SON certification. Uh, I don't I don't think so. I don't think so. Does it have to go back to that is standard? I understand your question. You are saying second hand product. If one if one buys products. Mm. Second hand. I don't think you need you need standard of organization uh, and this thing for second hand product because the person buying from you knows uh, that yes. he's buying a second hand. So do you have any, to uh, satisfy it? Uh, that's yeah. why I you said to satisfy the other estimate. No, that's why I said if it's second hand, the person buying from you knows second hand. So it's not the responsibility of uh, of uh, of standard organization or you need i don't even think it will fall within the inventory of standard organization uh, of nigeria for you to register such with them then is when it is new 
and you are going into the manufacture, then you need to, or you are importing such new things, then you need to get their certification. On Remember I said the product must fall within their inventory. But you see some products like iron, fire extinguisher and the rest carrying standard of organization of Nigeria logo. That means to show you that it has been certified. But for more details and information, you can go to their office and, and get that. Their office, if you are in Abuja, is located as in seven. Okay, any more questions? Are you okay, sir? Okay, in the absence of any question, is it going uh, to have their don't you have another thing? I Hello, said sir? that is it only in Abuja that there are no no there should be offices, branch offices in other states. So there should be branch offices. Let me give you a tip on how you can just get to their office. You could just Google it and it will bring out the addresses. So in the absence of uh, any question, we've come to the end of this lecture. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand you over to, okay, that's okay. Where there will be quiz. Okay. Are we still having quiz? Yes, there will be quiz posted. We have, oh, okay, after okay. The, after the lecture. So okay. that's the end of the lecture for today. Thank you very much. Different from the one we have before the lecture. Yes, different from the one you had before the lecture. So this is to assess you uh, on uh, what you've learned so that they see that you've learned uh, from what's... Uh, so I'm still finding it difficult to screenshot my score. To screenshot, that, that will be from the settings of your phone. You get okay. somebody to do so that you know how to... Or there's, there, you can go to Google Store. Oh, sorry. Yeah, those... So App Store, then you download <laughs> an app that will help you to be screenshotting from your phone. Hey, be... but, sir, let, please, does it mean that without doing that, uh, you people don't have the record on, to be able to uh, compile? Well, it's better you do that because that will that mm. will ease our work. Mm. Okay. Uh, right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sir. So. In the absence of any question, thank you very much for attending to this class. And uh, I'll come to the end of today's class. So you wait for your quiz. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, sir.